Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. Oh man, right now you guys, we are in a series called For the Love of the Elephant in the Room. Um, Golly, we really workshopped this title a thousand times because what we really wanted to do was hold open some space for conversations that are so, so, so important, but we sort of collectively and chronically have resistance to them. Um, because they're hard, because they're complicated, maybe because they're polarizing, uh, maybe because they've got sort of a shame spiral like baked into it, um, which is why we're kind of all over the place. But we really brainstormed the various ways in which something really important was happening in our lives. And we were either unable or unwilling to steer into that curve. And so today we're talking about one of those elephants, which is grief. Um, And of course, as always, I'm super frank and open with you. As you know, 2020, 2021 was just a grief filled year for me. Um, uh, You know, end of marriage. So I was grieving the life I thought I was going to have till I was dead. Um, I was grieving the life I thought my kids were going to have. Um, we just, we just trudged and slogged through so many months of, I don't know, mess. Um, and I just want to tell you that we came out on the other side, like ready to live. Um, and if I have learned anything, gosh, I've learned so much. I have got a million things to say about that. But one thing that I've learned is that life is here, you guys, and this is it. And it comes with the, um, the good parts and it comes with the bad parts. And yet this is still it. This is still our one life to live. I'm so personally thrilled to welcome life back (laughs) for me, for my family. Um, But one thing I'd like to acknowledge today with my incredible guest, you're going to be so charmed, um, is I want to acknowledge the peace that grieving actually brought me. Um, I needed that. I needed it. I needed to grieve. It was required um, for me to be where I am today. Um, We needed that time to cry and to hurt and to mourn um, without anybody, including ourselves, hustling us through it um, without saying, okay, that's enough. Or without saying, Jen, you're the only adult in the house. You've got to now be stronger than this. You got to keep the wheels on. Um, The grief process as it was in real time, brought us through. Um, So I know that grief is not the standard topic that we like to bring up at the family picnics. Hello. I mean, what'd you think the series was? Um, But the stigma and the confusion around grief has got to go. Um, Because honestly, I mean, I was telling the girls, every single one of us has grieved, are currently grieving. And if you haven't, just live longer. Like this is, this is, ubiquitous to every single one of us. So this matters. Um, So with that being said, who better to walk us through this process? Oh, you guys, I'm so, I know that these girls are most going to be new to most of you, and I'm so excited to be the introducer. Um, I am bringing to you today, the hosts of the Good Morning Podcast, which is M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Hello, so clever. You know, I love play on words. The Good Morning Podcast, Sal and M. So Sal and M, they are the delightful duo that are taking their podcast and Instagram account um, over in the hopes to provide comfort and resources and kind of a soft place to land for people who have experienced loss and grief um, and then be a helpful resource to move to move forward. Um, so just so you know, and they but they talk about this, but um, both Sal and M unexpectedly lost their moms in their early thirties. And so thus they joined this horrible club that nobody ever wants to be a part of, but once you're in it, you're in it. Um, And so they needed help. Um, They needed resources that approached grief in a relatable way, especially for young people. When we have this idea that we're not really going to experience true suffering maybe until we're a little older. Um, And so they were finding a, they were trying to find a place where their young early 30 grief of losing their moms could land. And so um, they met each other in a group, which they'll talk about. And through that experience, Good Morning was born. Their aim is to take the sort of unnecessary doom and gloom out of grief 
um, and replace it with what's true and real. And they share their own stories. They interview other people's stories. They approach this hard conversation head on with like unfiltered honesty, but also with humor. And I appreciate that in them because humor is one of the only things, humor is one of the things that gave me little pockets of relief and joy and possibility when I was kind of in the, in the throes of my own. I know I've been saying this lately, but I mean it every single time. If you're interested in ever watching one of these interviews, instead of just listening to it, we video and upload every single podcast interview over um, on my YouTube channel. And these girls are darling. Um, and so you may want to pop over there and watch this one. Otherwise you can listen to this just in your ears. Um, but anyway, this is such a useful conversation. If you have suffered or grieved in any way, you're going to be happy that you're here today. I think you're going to feel loved. You're going to feel seen. Um, you're going to feel resourced. Um, I know for me, I felt like relieved, like there's not really, you don't get grief wrong. Grief is hard because it's hard right? Not because we're doing it wrong. And so I love wrapping this conversation with two incredible people like this. And this is a good one. So please enjoy my conversation with the wonderfully insightful Sal and M. Sal and M, welcome to the For the Love podcast. I am 100% delighted to meet you and to host you today. Thank you for helicoptering your voices all the way across the pond. (laughs) Um, those of us over here in the States, don't worry, you guys, everything is going great over here in the United States. Don't, don't worry about us. It's just nothing's great over here right now. We need help. (laughs) It is so true. I mean, if we want to be in a contest right now about like, who's, who's what's going worse and where, um, I put us up at the top of the list. So, um, I'm so happy to have you. I've told my listeners, I think you're going to be new to a lot of my listeners. So I've told them a little bit about you girls and sort of high leveled for my crew, um, who you are, but if you wouldn't mind before we kind of get into, um, the weeds a little more, can you talk each, um, and, and, and we'll just start with you, um, about, um, who you are and where you are and kind of who are your people and just basically in general, and then we'll get into it in a minute, kind of what it is that you do. Yes, yeah, sure. So I am M. I am one half of the Good Morning Podcast. And so we are a global online community that provides candid conversations and insight content around grief and loss. And we do it in a way that's full of honesty and humor. So I live in Sydney, Australia, and I'll introduce Sal to you now. <laughs> Sal. Hi, I'm Sal. Um, I'm the other half of Good Morning. I am originally from the UK, but have lived in Australia for um, eight years. And yet I, um, Im and I founded Good Morning after we lost our mums suddenly. And basically our mission is to really open the conversation around a taboo topic, which is grief, Mm -hmm. but with honesty and a little bit of humour, because that's really important when you're grieving. It's so important. That was a lifeline for me. And I want to thank you for diving into a hard place. You know, this series on my show is um, called For the Love of the Elephant in the Room. And that's exactly what we're dealing with, which is things that are hard to talk about, things that people avoid, things that uh, kind of sometimes feel like an emotional grenade in the conversation, um, and that we are kind of landmines as we pick our way through them. And so, when we were building out the series, grief was one of those things we put into our brainstorm bucket. Cause I'm like, we're great. We're all, this is ubiquitous right now. We are grieving for various reasons. And grief is if you haven't grieved deeply, just live longer, you know, like this, this is all of us. And so we knew this was one of the topics that we really wanted to lean into the curve on. And so I really appreciate that this is your work um, and that you have chosen to use your own pain, suffering, and recovery to serve the community. I think it's incredible. Um, How did you guys find each other? Oh, it's a bit of a love story, isn't it? Oh, (laughs) yeah. I love this. I love friend love stories. Go on in, you tell it first. Firstly, we are so glad that you are doing this series. It's so fantastic what you're doing because the more conversations about grief, the better. It is a topic, like you said, that certainly still does have a lot of stigma attached to it. 
and it's a topic that society steers away from and can make people feel really uncomfortable, even though we all go through it. And it can end up leaving people feeling really incredibly isolated and alone. So basically, Sal and I were in that place where we felt really isolated and alone in our grief. We felt like no one truly understood. Mm -hmm. Although we were surrounded by, you know, friends and family and a good support network, we felt like no one understood what we were going through. So um, our mums died suddenly, as Sal mentioned. Sal's mum died of a sudden seizure and my mum died by suicide. Mm -hmm. And they were both, you know, unexpected and came as huge shocks to both of us. And um we didn't expect to lose our mums in our thirties mm. and we just found ourselves like knee deep in a very uncomfortable and unfamiliar place. So we reached out to a support network. It's called motherless daughters and it's mm. here in Australia. I know there's one in the States as well run by hope mm. Edelman. Um, some of your listeners may be familiar mm. and yeah, it was just sort of a chance meeting and we were, we rocked up at this support group lunch and it was kind of in the middle, middle of COVID so only 10 people could attend. Yeah. And we didn't actually talk to each other on at the day, but, like, I clocked Sal across the table. I'm sure, like, she looks like I my kind this. of person. It was like yeah. an energy exchange across the table and um, I kind of had overheard that her mum had died suddenly as well. And although the circumstances were different, I was like, yeah. mm, I'm going to hit her up after this. Yes. <laughs> so I slid into her DMs on Facebook and, yeah, we just we connected and it was just so nice to talk to someone who knew what I was going through and just Absolutely. she got it, mm. wasn't it, Sal? <laughs> it really, really was. And I think despite us both having a really strong network, Mm -hmm. we still felt really isolated and alone in our grief because none of our peers has experienced a big loss. We, um, you know, we're both in our early thirties. We weren't expecting to kind of be faced with grief so early in our life. And it was just such a shock because until it happens to you, grief Mm -hmm. is just for everyone else. You know, you don't think... Um, about how you're going to handle it until the time comes, which inevitably it, it's going to. Um, so, yeah, we found ourselves sort of in this situation where we really longed for someone who just got it and someone mm-hmm. who understood. Um, so we became, you know, really good friends really quickly because we both had similar losses and we understood, you know, exactly what each other was going through and almost at each moment, you know, and it was so nice to have that somebody that you could say, hey, are you experiencing this? Like I'm feeling, you know, really exhausted or, you know, this kind of emotion. And we just both understood. Um and then from there, we were talking about, you know, how how can we help other people? You know, there must be lots of other people in the same situation who are feeling isolated in their grief, um, who don't have anyone to talk to. You know, as a society, I think when you're in grief, you, it's only then that you realise how very little we actually talk about it um, yes. and how much it is, you know, like your podcast series is called The Elephant in the Room. Yes. We just don't talk about it, even though we all go through it. So Im and I were like, what can we do to help change the conversation? Like, we need to talk about this more. And that's when we had the light bulb moment to start a podcast. And Good Morning was born. Um, and it's just gone gangbusters, hasn't, hasn't it, Im? I think yeah. people have just really <laughs> taken to it. And I think it's our approach to talking about things honestly. Yeah. You know, no filter, which I know, Jen, is very much like you as well. That's right. Um, but with a bit of humour. And, um, yeah, so that's how sort of we we came to be. I mean, it's working. We found you from Texas. So Amazing. Uh, I love however that. you put yourself <laughs> out into the universe, like we picked up what you're laying down. And <laughs> I'm so glad that we did because um, as I've kind of familiarized myself with your work, just our losses are different. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm coming off the loss of a 26 year marriage, which was, but there's so much similarity. It was shocking. It was unexpected. I had a story written for my life that yeah. ended abruptly for mine, for my kid. You know, you guys had a story. You, you, you you wrote your moms into your story until you were old. And so, you know, your story also changed and the trajectory of everything took a, took a transition. And so your work feels so familiar to me even though our losses are different. And I think that's why it's re- so resonant with people because y- y- although you use your st- personal stories as a real generous gift um, and as an anchor, th- the idea of it is 
relatable to uh, virtually all of us. And so um, I, you just mentioned that stigma, um, that certain subjects just come attached with stigma that we have managed to keep active generation after generation until we finally decide that we are going to break the cycle. Um, And this is what you're doing. This is your work around this specific space. And so as mentioned, you talk about grief, you help people work through that process. Um, And so I would just love to hear when, when you first started talking about this, and you put your little headphones on and you're like, here we go. This is public domain now <laughs> um, out of our little coffee group of 10, right? And into yeah, the yeah. World Wide Web, which is who knows what. <laughs> How did you know where to start? Um, did you think, okay, we're going to build a podcast that's going to be um, a little bit um, descriptive and a little bit prescriptive. We're going to, how did you begin to piece together the puzzle that is what you're doing now? Well, the first thing we sort of did was it all started, we'd, we'd catch up and we'd have lunch and we'd have coffees and we'd have the most deep chats that were amazing that we just felt like you, you, they're very rare. You don't get to you know, come across people that you can have those deep conversations with where they fully understand what you're going through. And it was just, yeah, we just felt like we need to be recording this for anyone else that's sitting at home alone and doesn't have that person Mm. to talk to or to understand because grief, no matter what you're experiencing loss from, is so confusing and it's so complex. And so we just started and we said, let's just start by interviewing each other and we'll tell our stories. Mm. And, you know, because we've got, although our, you know, losses were similar in many you know situations there were a lot of things that were were very different so sal mm-hmm. was living on the opposite side of the world to her mum when she died and my mum mm-hmm. you know died from suicide but she had never experienced any mental health issues so there were just so many mm-hmm. things were like there's got to be people around the world that can relate to this that need some help so we literally just started there and we're like let's just yeah. share our story in the hope that it can help somebody, somebody out there listening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And that's, that's where it started. And we, it was just so well received from the first few episodes that we did. And then we just started interviewing other people and their losses and, and how they survived. Mm. Because I think in the early days as well, like, especially for me and Sal, like we wanted to know how to survive. what Absolutely. When you're deep in it, you cannot see how you Mm. can get out of it. You know, you can't like looking so far into the future, as I'm sure you can understand, Jen, is frightening, Mm. you know, when you're you're going through loss of any any sort. So, yeah, we just really wanted to put out there how we were feeling in the hopes Mm. that it could resonate with somebody else feeling alone Mm -hmm. in their grief. And I love that as a resource because obviously we have the potential tools in our grief to, you know, we can reach and do and should we reach for our therapists and we reach for our counselors and sometimes our doctors. And those are um, incredible helpers too. But there is something powerful that transcends that level of intervention when we just get to pull up a seat to somebody else's table and hear their personal story. It just, it reaches it reaches us in a different way. Um, I think it's because um, you mentioned this earlier uh, for me, when all of a sudden I found myself holding a broken marriage that was not going to be repaired. uh, My eyes just started looking around everywhere. Who can understand this? I craved somebody who had been there. Um, The people in my life who love me dearly, in possession of beautiful long marriages, they meant everything to me too, but they don't understand. And so yeah. I found myself craving women to say, here is, I've been through this. This is what I did. You're going to make it. Um, and I think that's why, even if it, your format is just as simple as let's just open up the conversation, our grief, your grief, her grief. What did we learn? That's powerful in and of itself. It, it, you're offering healing tools to people. What are you, what are you beginning to hear from your community? What's the feedback here? And has anything been surprising? Um, I, I'm, I can't imagine you didn't know that some of this was going to really be meaningful, but I'm curious if you're like, whoa. The, the response has been overwhelming. We get messages probably about 
20 messages a day from people just saying, thank you for making me feel seen and heard and validated because I felt so alone in my grief Mm -hmm. and the way that you address things and the way you talk so honestly about what's actually going on for me, I, I just feel understood. And that just means like, it just means so much to us to to receive those messages. And we've had so many stories, haven't we, Im? We have. And I think the other thing as well is we started off by telling our stories and then we sort of took a different approach to our podcast where we really delve into uh, specific topics to do with grief. Like we'll talk about the guilt that you can experience and the shame and the anger and all the other sorts of emotions that can bubble to the surface that people don't talk about. Mm. And I think that's the stuff that has really resonated with people because they're like, I didn't even know that that's what I was experiencing, Mm. but everything that you said is like, you've taken it straight out of my mind. And I think that is what's working with it because we just, we aren't afraid to go there. (laughs) Exactly. We need some leaders to head headlong (laughs) into this conversation because I want to, I want to pick up something that you just said. And because some parts of grief are confusing and you just mentioned the grief and the shame. Most people don't automatically associate shame with grief, but when you've really been through it, um, you find all these spikes like, um, on that first good day you have in the middle of it. And you think, how could I possibly laugh? What is wrong with me? How can I be finding joy in the middle of this absolute shit show, right? Um, How can I not be just like tearing my clothes off and pulling my hair out? And so, um, or what could I have done differently? How is this my fault? All this stuff is like this horrible toxic soup that surrounds an already heavy loss. Um, And it makes it really confusing to know how to feel and to know how to manage that. I'd love to hear the both of you talk a little bit about what you have learned about um, this shame that sometimes is this surprising companion to grief. And then what are some of your tools to navigate it, to like resist it, to find your way through it? I think a toxic soup is an absolutely brilliant way to (laughs) to put it because you're so right. And I think we judge ourselves so heavily in our grief. We think, why aren't I on the floor every day? You know, if you're having a strong day, you judge yourself because you think I should be in floods of tears here, or you might be having a really hard day and you might think, shouldn't I be able to cope with this better? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. That was mine. (laughs) Yeah. And there's a shame that comes with that because we do judge ourselves. And I think it's a really simple thing to do, but it's just really trying to remove that judgment from yourself and just knowing that however you're coping with it, is the right way for you Um, and just trying to go really, really easy on yourself, Mm. which sometimes is actually easier said than done because we do judge ourselves so hard in our grief Um, and just, just being gentle on yourself. And it sounds so basic, but actually it's something that a lot of us don't do. So true. And, you know, like you said, Jen, when you have Mm. that first day where you feel like I'm okay, why Mm. am I feeling okay? Should I be more sad? Like that is really common in grief. And it is something that a lot of our community members have expressed. Mm. And we just want people to know, like, that is a natural part of the process. Like you're going to have days where you feel okay and you're going to feel guilty for it. (laughs) And it's just, it's normal. It's so normal. Um, But I think what, what we want people to know is that, Guilt, like grief is just so much more than just being sad. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that Um, because I think this is part of the reason why this is an elephant in the room topic because grief is sometimes just equated with sadness. And then when it comes with all this complexity and all this ancillary emotion and, and, and corollary damage, not only do we not know what to do with it, but nobody else does. They don't know what to do with it. And people don't know how to handle grief. Well, we're not good at this. We are like not good potato, at like, whole, isn't it? it? I would just like to hear you both talk about that a little. Yes. Like, um, what, what do we not understand about grief when we're on this side of it? Uh, or we're watching someone else grieve and we're feeling confused about why it's coming out sideways for them. Um, or whatever. I would just, this is something that you deal with on a daily basis. And I just kind of like to hear your thoughts on that. There are so many misconceptions about grief. Yeah. One of the biggest ones is that there is no linear path for it. 
the five stages of grief were never meant for the bereaved. They were never meant for people Thank you for grieving. saying that. They were meant for people who were in palliative care who were dying. So <laughs> right. we like literally. Really, yeah, it's just yes. mind blowing. And so the first thing you do when you're grieving is you Google like grief. Am I going to be okay? <laughs> What's going to happen to me? And what comes up? The five stages of grief. So you've got denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance and you think that it's going to happen in that linear stage in that linear timeline but it doesn't and some people may not experience some of those stages and some people may be feeling all five all at once so that's the first thing we want people to know which is you get rid back. of that yeah. you guys i remember the oh. first day because i was following the five steps i'm because yeah. i just wanted my path out like how how long when do I get to the end? When am I in stage five? And I remember one of the very first days and it was kind of early on. And for no apparent reason, I'm having like a, like a Zen day about the whole thing. And I'm like, I literally text my people and I'm like, I'm in stage five. I'm at, I'm there. I'm this at acceptance. I'm, done. <laughs> I'm at acceptance. <laughs> I, I made it. And then of course, like the very next day you're in absolute like denial. So it's, yeah. it's not, it's a harmful tool, actually, when we think that it is a straight path. Thank you for saying that. What else were you going to say, Sal? Well, I think people think that you can complete it, right? Like I'm at stage five, boom, I'm done. See you later, grief. <laughs> yes. I've made it. I've made it through. And I think, you know, we kind of want to tick it off sometimes like, right. Yeah. Anger. Cool. Done it. Um, and actually, as you well know, Jen, it is absolutely not linear and it's more like a, a big squiggle. Yes, And you just, you could feel it all in one day yeah. or sometimes one hour. Um, and I think mm. also another thing that took us both by surprise is, is how physically em- exhausting grief is. Oh, not only yes. emotionally exhausting, but, mm. but really physically it can take its toll on you as well. Like sometimes you feel like you've been partying for five days straight, you know, you are right. exhausted. Um, and that's something that we were both, we had to really recalibrate and reset kind of our systems mm. and really scale back what we were doing in those early stages and the early days of grief, because it, it really does take its toll, you mm. know, mentally, spiritually, physically as well. That's right. Thank you for saying that, um, because that is it, that was for me one of the things that absolutely blindsided me mm. was that physical toll. Because our bodies tell us. I mean, that's what our bodies are here for. They're here to say, slow down, give this the time and the attention it deserves. Go to sleep, eat some vegetables, like drink more. It, it, it's trying to help us get through it. But because I felt like my life was on fire. And everything was a five alarm moment. And I'm just trying to like keep the wheels on. I'm trying to keep the kids wheels on the body part. I I was like, whoa. I mean, I, I couldn't sleep. I, I felt like I had the flu. And then I spiked not only the first time in my life, anxiety and kind of a bit of depression that required some medicine, which is brand new for me. Never had that. But I also, I developed high blood pressure. Like our bodies will tell us what is up. Um, And so thank you for just including that as something to expect. And it's not because we're doing grief wrong. It's because that's how grief works. That's what it's doing. It's a trying. Our bodies are like, slow it down. Because most of us are trying to shove it forward. I know I was. Absolutely. And we have a joke that we, um, we call it grief face. (laughs) <laughs> because we say like we feel like we both feel like we've aged since our mums died and yeah. like a lot of our listeners and our community members yes. are like yeah you you feel like you've aged like you know it's it's, it's you a don't real recognize thing. yourself sometimes totally the bats yeah. of your eyes you guys last yeah. fall like for me this all broke last july so we're i'm just a little bit past the year mark and i remember last fall telling my friends for the first time in my life i'm like should I get Botox? My face, my face looks terrible. Like what, what is the great face here? Like (laughs) it is real. Like it really, really shows up. Well, here we are in a new year, 2022. Not sure how that happened, but I am delighted to be here with you and to be launching into this new series about elephants in the room. Clearly, we're starting the year with a bang here on the For the Love podcast. Therapy has actually sometimes been the elephant in the room in the past, but I think many communities and people are feeling more and more permission to talk about therapy in the freest, most liberating way. And this is 
such a beautiful thing. We, we also have more direct accessible entry points to therapy now more than ever, like thanks to companies like BetterHelp. They are such a good resource for professional counseling because it's all online. So your therapist literally meets you where you are. And BetterHelp's licensed therapists have a broad range of expertise categories, everything you guys, like grief as well as depression, anxiety, anger, family conflict, LGBTQ issues, eating disorders. I mean, literally, you name it. Um, You'll answer a very thoughtful questionnaire from the start so they can determine the best for you match with a therapist. You can even start communicating with someone in under 24 hours because it's all online. BetterHelp is not only convenient, it's also more affordable. So as a listener, you guys get this. You'll get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash for the love. And you can join more than 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash for the love. I want to ask you this yeah. question because also in the a deserving <clears throat> a spot in this discussion is that there are so many different forms of grief. There's like grieving a loved one. There's grieving a lost job. There's mm-hmm. grieving a father you never really had on Father's Day. Um, it, there's a million. There's a million things. And so the levels that come with grief are immense and they're confusing. And so some of them come on the heels of something that on its face doesn't even seem that monumental, right? Like, and all of a sudden grief just takes us down, um, that it's attached to something else, or it's, it's some unresolved other issues that have kind of piled on with it. And so how do we help people see that grief does not only exist after an absolute tragedy, right? Um, so that in addition to acknowledging that many, many things can cause us to grieve rightly, rightly so, that grief is kind of also our own personal process. And it doesn't have a timetable, as we mentioned, and no one can either really tell us how to do it or give us permission to do it, right? Like grief is grief. My friend Kristen always says, we are not in the hardship Olympics. So for those of us to say, I'm having grief, but yours is worse. And so I'm going to, I'm going to not talk about mine because yours feels like a harder grief than mine. And so rather than kind of connect through our like shared emotion, I'll just defer to yours because you win in the hardship Olympics. So can you talk through that a little bit, kind of the different forms of grief and how these kind of all fit together? I like that grief Olympics. It's like, you can't, you can't really out grief someone, can you? I think that's a really good point. Like everyone's yeah. grief is different and everyone's grief is is valid. And I think the grief that you're talking about, you know, a lot of people might not even realize that what they are experiencing is grief. Um, and mm-hmm. it's something called disenfranchised grief. And it's um, grief that society doesn't really talk about or acknowledge. So things like, you know, a relationship breakdown, a separation, mm-hmm. um, even, you know, with the events of the last two years, yes. you know, societal changes changes to you know work and changes to well-being and and even just uncertainty about the future um it can come in and show up in many forms but i think we aren't necessarily educated to recognize that we may be feeling grief around those circumstances and i think for anyone listening as well if you're going through a difficult time that's causing you any sort of pain it's important to recognize that what you are likely feeling is grief. And I don't Mm. think it's common for people to identify that, but as a first step, you need to be able to identify and acknowledge what you're experiencing in order to be able to begin to heal it. Um, So as you mentioned, Jen, like grief doesn't have a timetable and it shows up differently for everybody. And the thing is, it's, it's a universal experience that literally no one is exempt from, That's right. but it is also incredibly individual. So it's important for people not to judge their, their experiences or their grief based on somebody else's, you know, there is kind of this like unspoken hierarchy in grief, which is just That's ridiculous. Right. Like there really shouldn't be because what may be, you know, a huge experience to someone else might not be to another person. It's depending on what you've gone through in your life, how much you can handle, you know, this is so multi-layered. That's right. Um, we were having a really interesting interview yesterday 
um, with a psychologist and she was basically saying like when you grieve something, all of your past traumas and everything else Mm. and unprocessed grief comes to the surface, like things you didn't even know that you needed to deal with, which is definitely what's happened with Sal and I, like after the sudden deaths of our Mm. mums, all of this other stuff has just come up and it's like, what is this? I didn't even know that, you know, and, and as we were talking before, like grief, unprocessed grief stays trapped in the body. Like your body keeps the score. It'll stay in there. And when you go through something so huge as a loss, it'll force you to visit all of those things that you haven't processed. And it might not just be the divorce or the death that you're grieving now. It can be all these other things Mm. that you never faced and you never had the opportunity to. Mm. It's, It's almost like when you unpick one layer, something happens and you kind of then other things bubble to the surface and you're forced to sort of you know, face other elements that may be causing you grief. And for anyone listening who might be recognizing that they're feeling grief, um, a really good thing that Imogen and I do, and we encourage a lot of our listeners to do, is have what we call a grief sesh. And it's basically where you invite it in and you try and actively draw out your grief. So it might be putting on an ugly cry playlist or getting the photos out or doing some journaling, trying to like draw the emotions up and let it out. Because if you don't feel it, you don't heal it Mm. ultimately. Um, So that is one takeaway that maybe if you are feeling like you could do with processing some of the feelings is, is try and sit there with it and try and kind of invite it in. It's the best advice. And because we're just chronically um, uncomfortable with our own pain, Mm. this is something we try to avoid. Um, how can we not feel it is really the question that a lot of us ask when we're grieving. How, how can I get past this? How can I feel better? Um, how can I um, work out the calculus of this in my mind to kind of talk myself out of, of how this feels? I remember, because <clears throat> uh, I'd like to hear both of you talk about what you discovered to be some of your best tools, your processing tools. Again, these are not fix it, it's just a processing tool. There's no way around grief. It's only through it. Uh, I mean, you can try to go around it, but it'll come out later, as you just said. Um, What somebody very early on in my process handed me the possible resource of meditation. Um, Exactly for the exact reason you just said, Sal, so that I could find a way to be in it, like to stay in my body and feel the feels like, let's just, let's have them not push them. And I was just like, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for meditation. Like, uh, uh, however, that's Sal, that's literally Sal. Is Sal? Like, Am I singing just, your song? <clears throat> Listen, <laughs> I downloaded a meditation app week one. So, I mean, I am, I am, I, I, I'm in the bottom of the ocean <laughs> and, um, and I was just like, whatever. And I, I was in such shock. Um, and, and such a trauma response, I couldn't access any of it. I, I could barely access my feelings. I was just stunned. And so I, the first time that it just poured out of me, I, I just, my house was full of people. Everybody who loves me was here for one solid month. And so I'm full of people. Everything's just noise and I can't get still. So I'm like, I'm just going to get in my car. I'm going to drive. And I guess whatever, I'll just like play this. I don't know. I'll play this meditation (laughs) guided meditation. Um, It's an hour. I'll just play it and drive. So you guys, I pull out of my driveway. I hit play. I've got my little headphones on. I hit play. I get two sentences into this meditation. So I made it one block away from my house. One, I drove 500 yards away from my house, pulled over on the side of the road underneath my neighbor's tree. And when I tell you that I, I have never cried like that in my life. I cried for one hour and I don't mean cry. I screamed and I wailed and I, I I can't believe nobody called the police. Like I certainly looked like I was having an hour long episode under my neighbor's tree. Um, And it unlocked something in me that I needed that feeling I needed that to come out. And so nobody wants to sit in their car and scream and wail for an hour, but I'm so grateful that I could and that I did. 
And that I was finding a way for my body to like at, just purge every feel as they came, feel them release, like feel them yes. go. Um, I can't recommend that enough. And I would like to hear what else you would add to the list of these are approaches or best practices. Again, this is not a template. I, I, I'm reluctant to kind of use those words, um, but maybe just some, some tools that, that kind of grabbed you guys by the hand and kind of began to walk you through process and recovery. You're so right. It is, t- it is a toolkit that you need. They're just tools that are going to help you. You know, it's nothing's going to be a quick fix. Yeah. So these things are only going to help you a little bit, but um, definitely writing is so cathartic, you know, just getting everything out on paper, how you're feeling like journaling, like you don't have to, you know, make it a big thing. Like sometimes journaling can be a bit difficult for people, but just write how you're feeling, just get it out on the paper Mm -hmm. can be really helpful. Um, Just connecting with your body, Mm -hmm. like dropping back in your body. So anything that's going to do that, like yoga or running, or I do um, like 15 minutes of boxing a day, you know, because I can't like commit myself to any more. <laughs> it's just too that's hard. enough. Gosh. Yeah, just anything that's just going to get your body moving and get yes. that energy out. Um, I think breath work is a really big one. So yeah. just remembering to breathe deeply, even if it's for five seconds, it can really ground you and anchor you and kind of bring you back to a sort of safe, a safe place. Yes. And also remembering to take time off from your grief, which, which may Mm. sound hard to comprehend at first, but if you can have like, if you're knee deep in your grief, 45 minutes where you switch off and you watch a Netflix show, a comedy or something just to, just to give yourself a bit of reprieve. Yes. That that also can really help as well as obviously then having the tools to help you process things. I think it's important to, to take a break as well. Right. Cause you're not suggesting avoid it permanently but it will wear us out. Like having a break matters. Um, Mm. I was so grateful for those early moments where something got to be silly, you know, or something got to be funny or something was wonderful because that it's weirdly, that's how life works. The wonderful still keeps going and it's not all canceled out um, by our grief. And so finding a way to like kind of embrace those moments without feeling guilty about it, without shame was a tool for me as well. It's a new year, beloveds. We made it to 2022. This is a time where some of us may set resolutions or maybe intentions or words for our year. It's a great time to really reflect on where we need to just pull some different levers in our lives. This is why I'm also just so excited to introduce you to the Me Course series, which is a series that I have put out with my incredible team. Our mission here is simple. This is inspirational, educational, and actionable content, as I like to say, for the rest of us. It's not heady graduate level work here, okay? But it is what we all need, from finance, to building better habits, to cultivating simplicity in the name of wellness, and more. These are some of the pillars where I personally have seen the most life change in myself and in others. And so with me course, we are telling you what actually does work. And I do it with some friends, friends who are experts in their respective fields, and they talk you through it too. We've really distilled it all down to the best of the best, a true highlight reel of everything you need to know in real life and how to make it work for you without you needing to commit hours upon hours of your time, which you don't have. Here's what you can expect. Four 15-ish minute sessions, and that's it. But also, as you will see, that is enough. We They are packed and condensed without tons of fluff. We also have a whole library of bonus resources to explore and implement and remind you of what you learned. You get it all. Let's start learning together and be here for our lives in this way. So register now at mecourse.org and use the code for the love to save $10 off already discounted prices. This is the best deal. I can't wait. Mecourse.org. Join us. I'm going to ask you one last question before we start landing it here. And it's kind of two parts because I think another 
I think a major obstacle for a lot of us um, in, in order to kind of work through suffering like this is that number one, we're uncomfortable talking about our own grief. We, we hold it in. And I think what I hear primarily from the women in my community is they don't want to be a burden. They don't want to offload their grief on other people because it's already sad enough. So why make everybody else sad? Right. Um, um, or, you know, it's a, it's also kind of a fear response. I'm going to hand this to somebody and they're not going to treat it tenderly, which is possible by the way, that is possible. Um, so I want to talk about how do we overcome this self-protective instinct to hold it to ourselves? Cause all of my healing was found in community. I, I, I put it at the 95% mark. I couldn't have done this by myself. So that on one hand, and on the other hand, I'd like to hear what you, how you advise us, how do we stand next to somebody who is grieving without trying to hustle them through the process? Um, How do we walk alongside in a meaningful way, people who are in the throes of like loss or trauma? I think that connective tissue is something that we have to overcome because there's actually so much healing in our togetherness. As you girls found, you found each other, you've created the space you have now put into the universe, this entire healing place for people to come and begin to recover. It's, this is how it works. This is my thesis. Um, so can you talk about sort of those two points of resistance I think the first thing that we would want people to know is with a lot of loss, especially with the death of a loved one or a divorce, things like that, there's situations that can't necessarily be fixed. Mm. So what we would want people to do is hold space for that person. And I think what we instinctively try to do as human beings is fix situations. When people are going through pain or suffering, we want to fix it. And some situations can't be fixed. Mm -hmm. So what happens then is it can feel like the person is minimizing your experience by trying to, you know, say lots of well-meaning but unhelpful platitudes like, um, oh, at least, you know, at least you've still got your dad or at least, you know, they're in a better place or things like that, that people are trying to make you feel better, but can minimize how you're feeling. Mm. So the, the best thing to do is just, yeah, like hold the space. And it's a very hard thing to do. And it just means active listening, sitting with them, meeting them in whatever emotional state that they're in and just being there and, Mm listening and not judging and it's really yes. hard to do yes. and it's you know if you if you've not done it before so that would be the first mm. thing that people really need to do is mm. yeah learn how to hold the space oh the fix it instinct is so hard yeah. and it's because we care that comes from a place of good intention i know it's because it just our, our people's pain hurts us too and we want to relieve it we want to find an answer but there isn't an answer to grief that's just it's a it's a dead end road. And so yeah. developing the muscles to really just sit there with people that we love and say, this sucks. Mm-hmm. Like there is, this is horrible. Um, I know for me, I found comfort in people, not just saying um, like, this is terrible for you. And I'm sorry. And kind of like this idea this sucks for you. Um, but rather I'm with you in it. That meant a lot to me. Like, I can't fix this. This was, shouldn't have happened and it wasn't fair, but I promise you, I will be beside you all the way through this. That was comforting. Um, and it didn't make me feel so lonely in my sadness. Like everybody's on that side of the happy equation and I'm over here and they're like, sucks over there, you know? <laughs> um, so the people who were like able to come with me and be like, I don't have any answers, but I, I promise you I'll hold your hand. That's all it's I need. so important. Hmm. And I think, you know, another thing that you can do if you do want to stand with someone who is going through a difficult time, who's experiencing grief, but might not be ready to really open up and talk about it yet. Um, a sort of silent gesture that kind of shows I'm with you. is just being really proactive and thinking, right, what can I do to help lighten this person's load? That's probably really heavy right now. And Jen, I'm sure maybe a lot of your friends did this for you. Oh my gosh. 
but be proactive. So go, right, okay, what would help them? Is it walking their dogs for a month? Yes. Is it taking the kids to school? Is mm-hmm. it doing their groceries? It's okay. almost telling people what you're going to do for them as well. Because yes. if you ask someone who's grieving what they need, they probably can't tell you yeah, because they can't, they can't think. It. Yeah. <laughs> so just say, right, Jen, I'm going to do your groceries for the next That's month. Right. Tell me what you need and when you want me to do it. And I'll be there. And that's a really good thing that you can do to show someone that's going through a difficult time. I'm with Mm. you. I'm here. I've got your back. I'm going to help you. It's absolutely everything. I, uh, that is one of the key things I will take away from this season. I will, I will never treat somebody else's grief the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause now I know Um, my mom for the whole first month, she just, and my mom's not a fixer. So she didn't even have to squash that instinct. She, my mom can sit really quietly with a lot of complicated emotions. And so she just said, I'm just going to, I'm going to be at your house every day by eight o'clock. And I will just, I'm going to be on the porch with my coffee. I'm just here. I'm on the property. And (laughs) she did every single scrap of laundry for, for a month. I don't even, cause I don't, I, we were, I, what what were we eating? I, I don't even know what was happening. Yeah. So somehow, I don't know how she fed everybody and she did all the laundry without a lot of words, but like, I'll never forget that as long as I live, um, that she just did some of that menial heavy lifting for me when I was drowning. So it's not small. What you just said, Sal, that is, that is it. I think that's it. It's, it's as not complicated as that. It's so hard to, you know, Mm. to know one other tiny thing, which is, so helpful for anyone who's listening who may be supporting someone through grief is the slightest shift in language can mean so much. Like tell me more when you're grieving and someone says to you, how are you? It's like quite possibly the worst thing to ask because you are not okay. You know, even years down the line, you're still, you know, it's really hard. So we really suggest to people to just put it today at the end of the sentence. So just ask, how are you doing today? That's you good. Know, how are you doing in this moment? Like, yeah. and it can make room for such a, a more honest conversation. And um, because I think people will lie and we've both done it. We've both gone, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's fine. fine. Like, the house is burning down, but we're great. <laughs> it's too tiring. Uh, it's yeah, too tiring. Yeah. It's almost like emotional labor to have to give a high arching assessment of everything that's gone wrong. It, it, yeah. So that is so lovely. Like, what about now? Like how on this yeah. Wednesday, this minute. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, exactly. Yeah. What a good, um, I'll remember that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> girls, um, as we sort of land here, I want to ask you just a couple of off the top of your head questions. And I'm asking all the guests in the, um, elephant in the room series. Um, and you can just both answer, um, and Sal, we'll just start with you. So just as we're just kind of dealing with this very big idea of hard conversations as a rule, Mm -hmm. and maybe this has changed in your recent history, but how do you approach uncomfortable conversations, whatever it is, um, if it's challenging, if there's kind of a clash of ideology, if you're sharing difficult news, if you've got some sort of necessary confrontation, whatever it is, um, how, how do you approach a moment where you're going to have a conversation with somebody else and there's going to be some friction in it? With an open mind. And you know what? Trying to practice without judgment, which is not easy to do, Mm-mm. but it's so important when you're having these difficult conversations and trying just to go in there saying, I'm not going to judge this person. Even if we are having a conflict of, you know, of our opinions, mm. I'm going to go in with an open mind without judgment and with an open heart. Mm. Beautiful, not easy. Not easy. <laughs> not not easy. easy. Easier said than we, done. We automatically judge, but trying to dr- lower your judgment and uh-huh. you know that is an art in itself. But it's uh-huh. so important when the conversations are difficult. So important. Not only do we judge, but if you're like me at all, you like to be right. And so, somebody put a question in my head a long time ago, which was like, "Do you want to be right, or do you want this relationship to be well? Which one? Pick, because you can go to the grave always being right." Um, but you'll like burn this relationship to the ground. And so that, that is a very mature practice um, that I would love to see us put into public discourse uh, 
mm-hmm. but I'm just not going to hold my breath, girls. Okay. How would you answer <laughs> that? It's a mess out there, you guys. It's a I'm real mess. Honestly, like I've practiced this. It's really hard to do. There's something that Sal taught me. I can't ever remember the term. It's like, just swallow the frog. What is it, Sal? Oh, eat that frog. Eat, eat that, that frog. frog. So it's just, just it's right do here. it. Eat that frog. First thing in the morning, just do it. If there's something that you need to say, get that uncomfortable conversation out of the mm. way just do it because i i tend to like stew on it all day and oh, it sure. makes me anxious and i start panicking and oh just sure that frog yeah oh that's good you guys <laughs> <laughs> me too i don't want to eat the frog i want to write several stories in my head about yes. it i'm going to follow a handful of paths and see which one i think is going to happen um i'm going to invent some conversations that aren't even real um, so that is really <laughs> good really advice <laughs> um so Here's my next question. Just whatever kind of your first instinct is. What do you think is the primary? And there are many, um, but from your perspective, what would you say maybe is one of the primary downsides of ignoring the elephant in the room, whatever it is? Suppression. Uh, yeah. Right. In Which the wise lead- words of Dr. Edith Eager, mm-hmm. suppression leads to depression. She's amazing. If anyone doesn't isn't familiar with Dr. Edith Eager, she's a Holocaust survivor. She's incredible. But she basically mm. says anything you keep in the body is going to kill you. Get it out. Get wow. it out. Yikes. My favorite. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Wow. That's heavy. Yeah, she's she's amazing. And yeah. it's true. Like anything that stays stored in your body is yes. just going to keep manifesting physically for you until you release it. And that's that right. I'm on blood pressure medicine through. now. It will yeah, come out. It will do it. So mm. Oh, it's such good advice. Um, last question. And everybody gets this question in every single series. And so um, you can answer this however you like girls and it can be sweet and precious and like earnest, or it can be just absurd. Um, and we get it all. So it's fine. You just pick your poison here. I'm nervous. Um, yeah, no, no. <laughs> You just, you just throw it against the wall. Like what comes up for you? Cause the question is, um, what is saving your life right now? Right now we're kind of in that right now space. Um, an extra shot of coffee in the mornings for me, to be honest. <laughs> Smart girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's I'm real. So That's not a joke. <laughs> That'll power you through to lunch. <laughs> Um, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum and I can't drink coffee because I'm such a big ball of anxiety. So breathing saves my life, funnily enough, because it's not something that we consciously do very well. So breathing no. would be it for me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, the, the way I have learned to breathe this year, all of it. And I need guided help on that. I'm not good at it in my own head. I need somebody to tell me what to do. So yeah. I follow all those guided meditations. I mean, I have breathed every which way, square, what a, hold, release. <laughs> the There's so many yeah. ways to breathe. I didn't even know. I know. And they all work. Yeah. They all work. All my central <laughs> nervous system calms down. It works every time. Um, okay. You girls are amazing and I just love you. And I'm so proud of you for picking up this torch that you didn't have to, and now really being agents of such connection and healing for your communities and now for mine. And so really, really grateful. Can you please tell my listening community community where to find you? What are your handles? What's the best way to access what it is that you do? You can find us. We're very active over on Instagram. So you can find us at good morning podcast. So morning is spelt with a U and yeah, you can find our podcast on all the podcast platforms called good morning podcast. And we have also recently set up a private Facebook grief community group, Mm, which is just a wonderful place that you can go to if you need a little bit of extra support or comfort, because I know during this pandemic, people might not be able to access their usual services. And it is a beautiful community full of people grieving and you can write a post about anything. And there's always somebody there to answer you any time of the day or night. So you can find that at good morning grief community on facebook and that's us and our website is www.goodmorning.com.au i'm gonna send everybody to you and and what a good time for your work because we're all not just emerging but really still in a global grief And so we need this right now. We need this if we're going to be healthy. We need this to kind of, these are best practices for our kids. 
because they're grieving too. They've they've had a lot of losses, um, not just during our personal sorrows in our families, but just from COVID. And so I, it, this is so timely and so good. And um, I think these are the conversations and the tools that are going to, that are going to carry us through and carry us forward. And so well done you guys on <laughs> just being brave and, and putting this out into the world. Big fan, anything I can ever do to support your work um, or come alongside of you um, or introduce you to the people I know I'd love to do it. Thank, thank you, you so Jen. much, Jen. You're welcome. And thanks for having these conversations because yeah. they need to be had. And yeah, thanks for having this space for us all the way over in Texas. <laughs> yes, that's right, you we girls. So it. you guys have a good day because you're at coffee stage and I'm going to go cook dinner. So <laughs> I'm go breathe. that's kind of <laughs> where you, we're Jen. at. Thanks so much. Thanks, you guys. Some right, of your listeners. Okay. Guys, I hope that served you in some way and that maybe you saw your reflection in the conversations because whatever your grief is, so much of the processing is the same. So much of the pitfalls are the same. The surprises are the same. The, the body response is the same. And so we just have so much to learn from each other. My hope, um, not just in my own life, but in our community here, is that rather than resist the really vulnerable space that asks us to share our own grief and also hold the grief of other people, um, which is a hard thing to do. So rather than resist that, I hope that we can lean into one another and find the connection there because um, there's almost no comparable comfort than people who love you being with you in your pain. Because um, not that they're fixing it, not they're not, they can't. Um, so I would love to see us increase our levels of vulnerability, um, when it comes to this conversation that we are willing, um, we are willing to be in our bodies, in our own sorrow. We are willing to let the people that we love be in their bodies in their sorrow, and we will draw near and they to us. And so you're hundred percent going to want to follow these girls on their accounts. If you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, I'll have this whole episode. So I'll have the show notes. Um, I will have links to their, to their podcast. I'll have links to their socials, much more to come in this really good series. I mean, we're just, it's in here guys. We're doing the stuff. We're doing the stuff. We're doing divorce. We're doing sex. We're doing it all. It's the stuff that make us either uncomfortable or squeamish. We're like, Hey, let's talk about that for an hour. Um, you know us. So um, you're not going to want to miss any episodes in the series. By the way, thank you for subscribing and um, and sharing and rating and reviewing the show. It is means so much to us. Um, and we're just grateful for you. You're just the greatest listening community. And it's such a, it's just a joy to serve you. So Laura and her crew and Amanda and I love you. And we'll see you next week.